Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity to gather and the opportunity to once again uh, be able to show our love and adoration for you today through the service. Father, just help us to raise our voices and to uh, do those things today that are pleasing to you. We pray this all in your Son's name. Amen. All right, I say this last announcement for now. Um, two weeks from today, two weeks from today, we will be having a meeting after church. It is for Vacation Bible School. Okay? We always do things a little bit different here, and so we are doing a Christmas Vacation Bible School. Uh, the kids are out of school until the uh, Monday the 9th or 10th, and so that week of January 3rd through the 8th, we are going to do Vacation Bible School here. In order to do that, we're looking for volunteers that will come and meet with us at the meeting, and we need things such as uh, teachers, we need things such as uh, craft people, um, snack people, people to volunteer to do scenery and set set building and making and stuff like that. So a lot of different things for a lot of different people to do. Two weeks from today after church, we will have that meeting for VBS. If you're interested, please join us there and we'll see what we can do to uh, get some of the kids rolling around here. All right? Happy birthday to you.
Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I've entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. As we come to the Lord's table, it is absolutely essential that we understand the importance of preparation. Otherwise, we risk partaking in an unworthy manner, sinning against the Lord. This is why we are called to examine our hearts and our motives before we approach the Lord's altar. You see, like Simon the Pharisee, Jesus knows the condition of our hearts and our every thoughts, whether they're pure or whether they're wicked. In Simon's case, he had passed judgment on this woman for her past sins, as well as Jesus. We're told in Matthew 7, Judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgments you pronounce, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus makes this evident to Simon as he shows him how he stacked up against the woman's sins by pointing out the things that Simon failed to do just since Jesus had entered his house. For in the parable that Jesus told, he reveals to us that it's a condition of the heart of the one who is truly repentant. Therefore, because of the woman's awareness of her guilt, she humbled herself before Jesus. Thus, through her actions, she has confessed her iniquities, and because of her genuine repentance, she was forgiven. Matthew 6.14 tells us, For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is why it's imperative that if you have something against your brother when you bring your gift to the altar, you leave your gift at the altar and go first and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Only then can you be reconciled with the Lord. This morning you've been invited to join the Lord at his table. And yes, Jesus knows the condition of your heart and your every thoughts. By preparing our hearts prior to going to the table, we clear our minds and free our conscience that we can clearly focus our full attention on these sacred emblems and thus receive the blood that cleanses all sin. In this manner, we not only participate in the remembrance of Christ, but we honor Him as we proclaim His death until He comes again. And all God's people said, Amen. <coughs>
opportunity that we can be together again today to praise you and accept the offering we're about to give you today, no matter if it's from somebody who can't afford an offering, to those that can. We give them generously and hopefully with all our heart that you may further your work here within the church and throughout the United States. In your precious name we pray. Amen. continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure faith faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows and their distress and keep our keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So he starts off by saying, do not be merely listeners of the word, but be doers only. What does that mean? And he starts off there. What does that mean, doer? If you talk the talk, you walk the walk. If you talk the talk, walk the walk. If you're going to be his, then be his. You know? How many people do you know call themselves Christians, but when you watch them live throughout the week, you don't see it? 
See, as we look in the windows of their souls, we can see what's there. And what, what, what has to be reflected in the mirror of their life is what the Word tells us to do. That's what it's talking about here. It says if we, if we, anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks into his face in the mirror and forgets. I mean, we have to look at the Word, we have to read the Word, we have to understand the Word, and we have to let that Word become a part of us. Then as people look through the window of our lives, they can see what's reflected from the Word in us. Otherwise, if we're not reflecting the Word, what do they see? The world. Yeah. Huh? Cobwebs and dirty spots or flesh. a lot of junk. Flesh. Yeah. What do you want people to see? Do you want people to see your Christ-like side or your worldly side? See how I look at that Christ-like worldly? <laughs> what do you want them to see in you? Christ-like. You want them to see Jesus. If you want them to see Jesus, then you have to know Jesus. That's what this scripture is talking about. Knowing the word is not good enough. Satan knows, right? But doing the word. What does the word tell us to do? I mean, our, our main verse, our main goal. Go ye therefore into all the world, teaching, preaching, and baptizing, right? But we have a something to do. What good is that scripture if we don't do it? Nothing. Nothing. If we don't go. Nothing. Bud's trying to sell real estate. How good would he be at if he never goes to the office and never looks online to see if there's anybody looking for a house? He can know everything about selling real estate inside and out, but if he doesn't go out and find someone that wants to buy or someone who wants to sell, what good is all his knowledge? And all of, us, all of us have jobs like that. All of us have things in our lives, but if we don't do what we know, then what good are we? How many of you know Jesus? How many of you do Jesus? It's always funny when you ask those questions. How many of you know? How many of you do? It's like you're waving. What's the difference? What good is it to know if we're not going to do? It's, it's, through the, it's through the mirror. Um, one author put it this way. He said, um, the Bible is a mirror that lets us see ourselves as God sees us. As God sees us. How does God see you? I mean, I looked at the statistics yesterday, and they're saying that 83.4% of Americans in this country claim to be Christian. And if 83.4% of this country voted and acted like Christians, how different would this country be? If 83.4% of this country stood up against abortion, stood up against um, going to the Supreme Court this week, use of bathrooms, how different would it be? And, and yet, and yet, look where we're at. You know why? They looked into the mirror, and after looking at themselves, they went away immediately and forgot what they had looked at. They looked at the Word, and they read it, and they read the Word, but it didn't penetrate, it didn't take root, it didn't become a part of them, and so it's just words. And if it's just words, and if it's just a word, I'm a Christian, what good is it? But if the word takes root, if the word gets in, if the word makes a difference, if the word is there and it's being lived and you are a doer of the word, what will it do? See, because all of you are sitting here this morning because the word means
mean something to you. The word means enough that you're going to get up in the morning and you're going to clean yourself up and you're going to come and you're going to sit here in a chair and you're going to sing songs of worship to God and you're going to commune with Him at the table and you're going to listen to His word and hopefully do something with the experience you had here today. Otherwise, what good is this? What did you come for? The Word. Some came for the Word. Some came for the fellowship. Some came because there's donuts. Some came to see the clown up front and see what he's going to do this week. I mean, I mean, you came for different reasons, for different purposes, but if it wasn't for Christ, if it wasn't to be strengthened, if it wasn't to learn and then go and do... We're wasting our time. Every week we come and we meet. Every week we come and we look at the Word. Every week we sing the songs of, of God. And I give my all. I give my all. I surrender all today. We sing all. Do you mean it? I had a preacher one time that stood up and began this whole sermon on, on the songs. And he said, look at every word. And in his sermon, he had to put the words back up. And I went through every psalm, word by word. He said, do you mean it? We say, I surrender all. Did you? Did you completely give it all? You see, because if I'm his, quirky things in church don't make a difference. If I'm really his, people that get on my nerves make a difference. If I came here for the right purpose and the right thing, you could say whatever you want. I'm going to get the message. Amen. Because I came here focused and ready. Because I want my mirror to reflect what God's telling me to do. But some of you are listening intently to a baby scream. Some of you allow the candy wrapper next to you being open to, to take your attention away. Some of you didn't sing one of these songs because you didn't like it. I might have spoke to your soul so you don't sing. Some of you have issues with what some people do with, with communion. Some of you didn't listen to the communion meditation. You were busy doing something else. Some of you weren't prepared today to take communion, but you took. Some of you aren't here right now because of things in your life that are going on and your mind is somewhere else and you're, you're, you're into something else. What will you reflect when you leave here? You see, preparation started Tuesday. Tuesday morning I started preparing the sermon to see what it is that God wanted us to say this week. So that I could reflect. So I could be the mirror this morning that you look into and I can reflect what God had. Amen. And every day this week preparation took place for the service here. Neil didn't just come up with what he was going to say five minutes before he got up here to say it. You know how you know that? He had it all right here. It all written out. He knew what he wanted to say and how he wanted to say it because he wanted to reflect what communion was all about, what God was expecting of us. To leave that gift at the altar and make sure the heart was pure before we offered that gift and took that communion. Did you all hear that today? Amen. When he said it? That should make you think. That's the reason that person is up here is to make you think about what you're going to take, what you're going to do, so that you reflect what the Word wants you to do. This morning you're sitting here and you're taking in the songs, you're taking in the communion, you're taking in the Word, and the question is only this. As you read this, now what do you do? 
Some of you are going to walk away from here this morning and it's going to be out of your mind. You're going to walk away from the mirror that you're looking at and you're going to go out to the world and, and what was said here and what was saying here and what was done here is not going to mean anything because the world's going to take over. I know it. It happens. I'm human. It happens. We get so involved in that that we get so busy. In Sunday school they said busyness is our business. We get so busy in our lives that we don't know what to do. That we forget whose we are sometimes and what we're supposed to be doing. We forget who we're supposed to be reflecting out of our mirrors so that when people look through the window they see what they're supposed to see. It's a sorry sight if you come to church on Sunday morning and you look through my window and you leave here with the image of me. Because I am not going to get you through this week. I am not going to give you the strength you need. I'm not going to give you the abilities that it's going to take to manage what Satan is going to throw at you this week. My prayer when I when I prepare and get ready to come here and, and do these is that you see Christ in me, that I'm reflecting the image that you need to see so that when you leave here, you have that image in your mind. That when you leave here, you don't forget immediately what you saw, but that you take it with you. And, and at some point in the week, somebody says something that strikes you and it's like, wow. Sunday they said it. I'm supposed to be doing. I wasn't doing today. I was supposed to be doing. That reminds you. Or maybe a lyric from one of the songs comes up in your head. You don't know why, but all of a sudden you're singing, I and you're going on and on and on. There's a reason for that. Holy Spirit trying to get your attention to say, hey, there's an opportunity here to be a doer. Don't mistake it. They didn't they even tell you who to do it to. Well, what pure religion, it, it, it's doing to the orphans and the widows. It's helping people. It's giving of yourself to make others better. To do. Go ye therefore to all the world, teaching, preaching, and baptizing. <clears throat> Making disciples for Christ so that they too can join us in church, be strengthened each week, and go out and do. Don't look in front of you. Don't look behind you. Don't look at either side of you. You have to close your eyes and imagine a mirror in front of you and look in that mirror. Be honest with yourself. What do you see? In your life, in the things that you're doing, in the things you did this past week, the things you were a part of, the things you said, things that you are, what do you see? I mean, the conclusion of my sermon is that you see Jesus. That as you look into that mirror of your life that only you can see, you see Jesus. Because that's the only way that someone out there is going to look through the window into your soul and see Jesus. If when you look in the mirror you can't see Him, we can't see. It. We have to be doers of the word, and the doing part that first makes sense is doing for us. What did you do this week to make you more like Jesus? What were you a part of this week that Jesus moved in and took more residence of? See, I told him in Sunday school, I said, man, you're going to hear all this in church. Because the part that we were in in church was to be empty, to be filled. And the whole lesson spoken in my sermon today on how to be a doer is you have to empty yourself of yourself. And not just the sin in yourself. Mark brought up, but the clutter. What have you cluttered your life with that it takes up so much time that you don't have time for God? I mean, my, my sister is sitting here on the front row. I told her not to do that because I spit. She did it anyway. <laughs> and, and my brother-in-law. And, and they've had a whirlwind a couple of months. And we were able to follow them on their journey. They, they left up by Chicago and they went all the way through the northern part of the United States, down through California, all across. 
And everywhere they stopped, they posted all these pictures. And you, you can see it. And you know what you see in every picture that they post? God. You saw them in the Grand Canyon. You saw them in San Antonio, Texas. You saw them everywhere they went and the things they saw. You can just see His handiwork. And the reflection of nature is, is God. And what God's desire is, is that when we look at those pictures and we see these two in them, <coughs> it's a stretch. <laughs> but we hope when we see God in nature, we see God in them. It's not a stretch. I mean, you can see it in them. If you know them like I know them, you see their lives that they're about, you know who's them. And so you get the full picture there of what all is there. And that's what God has want from each of us. Take a snapshot of yourself today. What do you see? Who do you see? What's living right here? Jesus. What's being reflected out of you to others? And if the answer isn't Jesus, you've got work. If when people look through your window, the reflection they see is not Jesus, we've got a lot to do. Because when I walked an aisle and gave my life to Him, I said, here, I no longer live, but you live in me. That means all of me. It means completely everything I have is His. I'm going to tell you something today. I'm your minister and it's not. Not proud of that. Not good. It's kind of a shameful thing to say, but I'm not 100% His. I've held back. I gave the analogy in Sunday school that we we have this bag of clutter and sin that that we don't want to get rid of, and we have a little familiar sins that it's like a good friend to us, and we have this clutter that keeps us busy that and we drag it along, and we can't get to where God really wants us because we're so busy dragging that bag. And then Jeff made a perfect illustration out when he said, "It's like you have that ball and chain on your ankle, and you have the key in your hand." won't use it. And someone will ask you, you've you got the key and the, there's the, why don't you just unlock it? Because I like it. I'm used to it. That sin is my friend. And that sin is what's going to be reflected in your life. And when you read this verse, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks into his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law, the mirror, that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. He will be blessed in what He does. Again, that's where we want to live in that blessed land. That, that's where we want to be with That God will bless what we are doing because we are His, reflecting His Word, His life in ours. This morning, look in the mirror. Look and see what's there. If you're here this morning and you've never looked in the mirror, and you've never seen that Jesus, and you've never have known that man, this morning we give you an opportunity to accept Him. We give you an opportunity to come down and, and to look Him square in the face and say, I need what you're giving. I need forgiveness of my sins. I need salvation for my life. I need redemption from all that I am. I need to be yours. I want to reflect you in my life so as people look at my window, they see you. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're sitting here and you've already done all that. We said it in Sunday school, sometimes we say, here God, 
take it, take me here. And we go, oh, but leave me this, 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 this. I like it. And this morning, if you're here and that's you, God's calling you up. God's saying, give it up. Be what I'll have you to be, not what you want to be. Allow my spirit to guide and direct you to where you need to be and what doing those things that I have for you to do in this life. Don't just be a hearer. This morning, if you have a decision to make for the first time, I'll give you that opportunity. Or maybe for the tenth time or hundredth time, you need to get back on track and you need to be His, doing His will. We're going to listen to uh, an artist named Laura Daigle. She's singing our invitation for us today. Uh, I want you to just stay seated. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Imagine a mirror. Listen to the words close. And there are some great words she's going to sing. And ask yourself if there's something that doesn't need to be changed so you can do more. Just close your eyes as we listen to the song. Mm -hmm. 